Hi, I'm Marcus Ludi, your professor for Physics 104A, Undergrad Math Methods for Physics. I'm speaking to you by video because I won't be able to be there for the first day of class. You'll have an able substitute, Professor Lloyd Knox, and you'll start working on the material on the first day. There's a reading assignment and you'll get more out of the class if you do that before class. The reading assignment is posted under the calendar on SmartSite, and I'll talk a little more later about where to find everything. Let me start with some general remarks about the subject of this class. Physicists use mathematics in a way very different from mathematicians. In physics, it's more important to understand simple math really well than it is to know a lot of fancy math. Physicists think of math as a tool, a way of approximating reality, not as a thing in itself the way mathematicians do. To a physicist, an integral is almost always an approximation to a sum. For example, Doing an integral to find the total mass of an object is really just an approximation to adding up the masses of all the molecules that make up the object. If the integral doesn't converge, it means something interesting is going on, like some approximation or the model we're using is breaking down. When this happens, we don't need fancier math. We need to figure out what is wrong with our approximation or our model and improve that. So in this class, you'll study the core mathematics that you need to understand the material in advanced undergrad courses on electromagnetism, quantum mechanics, and beyond. Much of this will be material that you've seen before, but the aim in this class is to become fluent in it so you can use it to solve problems. That way, math won't get in the way of learning the physics in your advanced physics courses. Now let's talk a little about the mechanics of this course. As I said already, you can find all the information about this course on SmartSight, which you already found if you're watching this video. Every day except for the first day, there'll be something due in class, so you'll need to check SmartSight frequently to make sure you stay on top of everything. There'll be a daily problem due every day, as well as weekly problem sets. The daily problem is posted in the calendar, and the problem sets are posted under assignments. You may want to pause the video now and find these. The daily problems are graded only on effort. The weekly problems are graded in detail for correctness as well as clarity. You have to show your work in your homework solutions. The steps leading to the answer have to be clear. There will also be two midterms and a final exam. The final exam is comprehensive. This class is all about solving problems, and you'll be doing a lot of that. You're welcome to work together on the homework problems, but beware of the pitfall of relying on other students for solutions. You may think that you're learning that way, but more than likely you won't do well on the exams. So here's some advice. If you work in a study group, be sure that you make a serious attempt to solve all the problems by yourself before you talk to others about them. And make sure that you're giving as much as receiving in any group that you work with. Physics is a hard subject to learn but it's impossible without making a lot of mistakes. Now, a lot of students these days are afraid to make mistakes. In K through 12, it's common nowadays for good students to get close to 100% on most assignments in most of their classes, and making a single mistake can be the difference between an A and a B. But here's the thing. If you don't make mistakes, you are never going to learn anything really difficult. Think about it. You learn by going to where your knowledge ends and then pushing farther. And that's how it is when you do research in physics. As one of my undergraduate professors once told me, if you know what you're doing, it ain't research. Now if this is totally obvious to you, please forgive me, but I know from experience that some of my students have a really hard time with this. So I hope you can join me in creating a no freak zone for mistakes in this class. Here's some numbers to put this in perspective. The average on a typical exam in this class is usually around 60%, and a typical A student will get something like 80%. So if you think you're failing this class, do yourself a big favor. Remind yourself that this class is graded on a curve, and check your score against the average. You'll probably be pleasantly surprised. Now, I want to say something about studying in this class, and actually in all physics classes. I think that reading notes and solutions to problems has very limited value in learning how to do physics. The reason is that when we see a solved problem, it's usually pretty easy to agree that each step makes sense.
But if you're trying to solve a problem where you don't know the solution, you realize that there are an infinite number of steps that seem like they make sense, but most of them are wrong or lead nowhere. That explains why the most common complaint physics professors hear from their students is this. I understand the book and your lectures, but I can't do the problems. So when it's time to study for exams, I suggest you do it by doing more problems where you don't know the answer. There are additional problems in the text, and I will give you example problems to study. A really important part of studying is also to compare your homework problems to the solutions that are posted. There's usually more than one way to do a problem, and I promise you it will be valuable to understand the posted solutions, no matter how well or poorly you did on that problem. At that point, you will have spent a fair amount of time thinking about the problem, and you're perfectly primed to learn from the solution. Or maybe your solution is better than mine, and I can learn something. Now let's talk about grading. I grade on a curve. The top 30% of the student get A's, the next 40% get B's, and the last 30% get C's. I'll give a grade lower than C only on a case-by-case -case basis for exceptionally poor work. Now, I suspect that many of you won't be thrilled that the class, class is graded on a curve. Many students feel that the curve pits them against each other, or it makes them uncomfortable that a fixed number of students will get a C. But I have news for you. Every professor in large classes grades on a curve. They give the same fraction of A's, B's, and C's year after year. If there are too many good grades on an exam, they adjust the grading scale or make the remaining material harder. If we want to compare different grading schemes, we have to keep in mind what grading is for. First of all, it's not about me judging you or predicting whether you will be successful, even within the narrow field of physics. I sincerely hope that all the students who don't get A's in this class prove that their grade does not define them by going out and totally kicking butt in their next class, in their career, and in their life. As far as I'm concerned, the purpose of grades is to motivate you to do your best, and also to give you feedback on how you're doing. I think if you think about it, you'll see that comparing yourself to the rest of the class is really the best way to do this. It's totally clear what the grade means, and you can't say that it's impossible to get an A when 30% of the class is guaranteed to do it. That's all I have to say for now. I look forward to meeting each and every one of you in class. And get ready to make some totally awesome mistakes. <laughs>